Welcome everyone, you are in track A and this is our third dynamic uh, presentation session of the day. I give to you Roadmaps and Roadblocks to Federal Electronic Records Management by David Simmons, uh, Knowledge Management Specialist, Senior Records Officer uh, in the General Services Administration or GSA, as well as Angela Pitts from Enterprise Knowledge and I'm Kim Glover and I'm looking forward to listening to and learning from them. There you go. Good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Angela Pitts, and it is really our pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you about a special project that was uh, done at General Services Administration. Uh, it involved uh, the Enterprise Document Management Solution, which we call the EDMS. And we had a project that had a roadmap, and we found that along the way we encountered some roadblocks and that we, we are here today to share our lessons learned. First, let me introduce to you my esteemed colleague, Dave <laughs> Simmons. Um, we've been friends for a while. Dave is, uh, was hired on at GSA as the KM specialist in 2007, but since then, he became a senior records officer, and he really was the brains behind uh, GSA's electronic records management initiative and the EDMS. And as the senior records officer, he authored the record schedule for GSA and was responsible for making sure that ERM was an enterprise-wide success. In addition, he is a subject matter expert for public building services and the liaison with GSA's OCIO. He doesn't stop there, though. He continues to share his knowledge with other federal agencies so that they also will be successful. And he's contributed as a speaker and writer for uh, Federal Computer Weekly for AIM, and he consults with agencies and serves on the ISO committees for document management topics. So it is really um, an opportunity for us to hear uh, what he has to say and also to ask some really great questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Now it's my turn to brag about Angela. <laughs> I met Angela long before I met her face to face in Patrick Land's book, Organizing Knowledge. He, he basically cited her uh, for her work she did for the military, particularly the Army, um, in his introduction. And when I, when I met her, I said, are you the Angela Pitts that, and she says, yeah. And I said, wow, because I've been reading your book, or the book that Patrick wrote about you. But um, Angela um, is a senior KM consultant at Enterprise Knowledge and uh, who were integrators on the EDMS project, both the strategy development as well as um, the overall day-to-day uh, -day operations of running an agile PMO for processing a lot of the content that got moved into this enterprise solution. Um, Angela, I met her shortly after we got started on this project, and she was introduced to me as the taxonomist. And when she said that, she says, I'm the taxonomist, and she's waiting for me to go, and I go, oh, taxonomy. <laughs> and I think I said something like, and do you deal in ontologies as well? And she's like, oh, this is a guy who understands what I'm talking about. And then I said, I'm the KM guy. So um, she's also worked, the, before that, she's worked at the Federal Reserve, the Army, Marine Corps, Navy, DHS, and is currently working with the Defense Acquisitions University which if, if any of you feder are federal agencies, how many federal agencies are people represented here? Oh, good number. Okay, because we're gonna lay the context for why you're here probably. <laughs> um, but she's been involved with DAU and a lot of the acquisition uh, learning that goes on among your contracting officers and the federal agencies is learned through DAU. And in some of those cases where your comptrollers are dealing in contracts as a contractor, uh, you, like Michael there, uh, you might be very familiar with DAU. Yeah, I'd point you out. I spent <laughs> half the day with you yesterday. Um, anyway, uh, what we're going to talk about today is, is our voyage and our story, our use case for GSA, which probably is applicable. Um, and one of the things, I, I'm, I'm a, a failure story. Uh, I'll describe this failure story. I was hired in in knowledge management in 2007. I worked very hard 
to understand the clients that I worked with in public building services in the Midwest region for six states, uh, dealing with all the construction and architectural for federal buildings and leased buildings. Um, and then also, uh, that's one branch of our, our agency. We also deal in fleets of cars, all the vehicles that the agencies uh, rent uh, or use, and then also the contracting and assisted acquisition procurements. Uh, we manage the lists of uh, things that all the agencies use to purchase from. And so there's a wide variety of information that comes in through GSA. And when I got started, it was only on public buildings, but funding got cut. And all of a sudden, people were saying, what's this knowledge management? Does anybody know what that is? Strike it off the list. And then they, they said, oh, we got somebody here who does knowledge management. Well, it's kind of like records management. Let's put him in records management. He's got a background in that, too. So I did. And so one of the things that was my aha after a couple weeks of going, I'm a KM guy, not an RM guy, uh, was I realized that records management is a form of knowledge management. And describing to many of the colleagues that when I was in the KM world, what I was doing, I remember nine years ago saying, yeah, records management, now I'm the guy with the pooper scooper after the KM parade, <laughs> cleaning up all those old documents and finding a home for them. And so that became, uh, that that's meme has changed in my mind to understanding the relationships that I built through both my previous knowledge management work but also in rewriting the schedules for all of GSA, um, we went from 2,000 record schedules uh, items to 86. In, and, and that was a big uh, labor of love that uh, took a lot of meeting with every business line and understanding what they value, which is a record, what information they value, and what information they value more than the others meaning how long we're going to keep hold of it until they, they don't no longer need it. And that insight made me realize that that kind of connections with the business lines is a form of knowledge management of understanding the business lines. So I changed the definition of what knowledge management is to being a person who has one foot in technology and one foot in the business lines and offers translation services to both to describe the business requirements for IT and to describe the IT capabilities for business. And so we started learning about the values and then also being in records management, I got a much more intimate view of document life cycles or content. I should be saying content rather than document, but content life cycles of value, not only just the creation process and then after it's created and set in stone, how much we want to take that forward and, and access that information and for how long is it going to be useful or relevant to the business lines to do their day-to-day -day work. And then the other thing is in, in records management, we focus on reducing resources and attention required by eliminating, actually destroying documents or sending them to NARA. <sighs> I know. I, I, I used to joke that I walk around, I, a contracting officer has, has a warrant to do business with a uh, with government on the behalf of government. I have a warrant to shred, so I carry a badge and a shredder. Uh, so, it, it, and eliminating a lot of that content and reducing it allows people to focus on what they need rather than searching for something and getting so much stuff they don't have time to sort through it. So that that creates some operational effect, efficiencies. Now, obviously. In, is this mine? Yeah. Okay. Obviously in this, we start talking about the future of federal records. And I, I really think of this as more redefining federal records uh, because it, it most, uh, <laughs> I joke that the best way to clear a room is to say the two words records management uh, because uh, half the people in this room probably don't want to be involved with records management or they're looking for a quick fix to the problem they've been, saw, they've been handed. And so one of the things is to, to not focus on the compliance stick, but think about the value you bring by doing records management. You save time on looking for information. Already had, had that one. We increase confidence that when you're looking for something, you're going to find it in five minutes, not five hours. And that you're going to protect 
uh, any uh, the organization and individuals from legal risk because you're able to provide those. Now, that is a big one because uh, this past administration we had a we had a president who had an interest in property development and GSA negotiated all those property contracts um, and construction plans and things like old post office, new FBI building come to mind, uh, mere blocks from here. Uh, but we had to make sure we had all the documents because when you have that kind of visibility of interest, there's sure to follow the 700% increase in FOIAs that we had in those four years. The, the number of data calls that we had from Congress, the numbers of people contacting us for public information and being able to provide it in, within a time frame of 20 business days for legal reasons. So we needed to make sure we had the information so that we could not be sued as an agency for not providing that public information. So that's the kind of legal risks that we were opened up to. I just sit down. I think this is you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So it's actually both of us. It all fit in. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about this GSA road trip. It's been a 10 year long trip, um, which is not that long when you think about uh, how, how much is involved in consolidating all of an enterprise, especially an organization as big as GSA, onto one centralized platform for enterprise records management, right? So this is not, that was no small feat. Um, so in the beginning, uh, it's, uh, we were held as our primary goal, which has persisted, to co-locate co the enterprise document records um, on a, one platform where the finished documents could be declared records and be processed through the records life cycle. Okay, so along the way, um, we decided we had to provide business rules for access and searching in the very beginning. Also, we had to have a definition of done, success measures. We had to recognize the broad array of projects that needed scoping, weighting, and prioritization. So like I said, when you're talking about an enterprise, that's a huge undertaking. And so when you're looking at priori prioritizing as to you know, what you do first and what comes next, you're going to look at your size, the urgency, the willingness of that, sub that organization or agency to provide resources, and along the way, you can see there are lots of curves and roadblocks, which Dave will point out to us. But uh, we had to define and refine the return on investment to keep the stakeholders involved. Dave, you want to tell them about the yeah. roadblock? One of the first thing, the first aha moments was uh, when, when Joe Hilger, uh, Angela's boss, came on, on board, he started laying down a lot of rules of the road. And this was based on some focus groups and based on all the carcasses and, uh, of previous document management initiatives that we were inheriting. And we learned that at, at the time, this was 2016, 17, right around there, uh, social media was very uh, hip and we were also very focused on collaboration platforms. And what, one of the first things we said was, this is not a collaboration platform. This is a place where you store things that are in a finished state. It could be a stage, of phase one of a finished state of a, of a project, but it had to be in a finished state, meaning there weren't going to be lots of drafts back and forth, lots of si signature things sent out for a review and approval and updates and things like that. That wasn't what document management was about. And so some of those rules of the road started, we started that dialogue with the users, each, each of these different projects. We, that was the first aha, that we had to start defining what we were not. The second one was the realization that that definition of done was a different definition for each project. And so we started out with the idea we were going to build the road and the cars would go, but as we started to work with these, this, this project management office, which became a project management office on migrations alone into the system, we had to design and understand the car that was going to be traveling on this road. So each collection was a car. 
that we had to des design and work on. And we had the DeLoreans, and we had the Etzels, and we had the stuff that never even got off the, the cinder blocks. And it was one of those things where designing those cars was a bit of a challenge. The other problem we bumped into was we didn't have a strong taxonomy in place. And that taxonomy is why Angela was brought in. And she worked hard to bring together a taxonomic structure of required fields for every document that they put in on migration. And it, it didn't quite go as well as we wanted it to. Would you admit that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and <laughs> when I was working with revising the entire record schedule, I realized that I had in my hands a taxonomy of describing the retention schedules and describing the kinds of documents that fall under there and all attached to a code, which is the number of the retention schedule. We could map every document to a record schedule and meet compliance with NARA's requirements for identifying electronic documents and retaining them for a per period of time on one hand, but for the user side of things, if it's a public building services drawing of the White House uh, and we have it on file, you could look up drawings in the record schedule and White House and get that document. So we had a structure in place that could start to uh, be used. So that, that was when we, we just finished updating the schedule in 2016. And the, so we started developing the business rules. And our first roadblock was the developers themselves. We hired in some developers. And they, of course, know content management. And they, of course, know all the servers and all the lingua of, of IT. And in his first week, the, the chief architect for this confessed to our project manager that he didn't think records management was a priority and they would do that last. What he didn't realize was the chief architect or the project owner was a good friend of mine. And I was on the I was the guy who wrote the initial paper to put this project on on the the, the building project or on the skids. He got it going. And basically what we ended up doing was he, he basically naysayed the fact that even though we bought a module for records management, his office was not going to do it. Well, those are fighting words to me. So I got on and figured it out and wrote the whole program, wrote the, took control of the module, built the entire schedule in there, and applied the business rules that uh, the system that we have currently called Alfresco uh, could use to generically identify all the documents that we brought in. That was the first one. The, well, the first one was just rewriting the schedule. The second was uh, dealing with uh, resistance to even naming that as a priority. Uh, we've since then overcome that with now uh, leadership uh, requiring that um, over 95% of the documents be tagged as records that are in our system. Uh, for our CIO, it's on the CIO's evaluation, by the way. Uh, I, I didn't plan that, and I didn't, I didn't bribe anybody to do that. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to know about it. Um, then as we started to get down this path, we, we basically updated the schedule, and I started identifying the fact that this module was very limited. So we had to go back a step, and every, in content models, they have, uh, in every document has a content model attached to it that has a lot of descriptor fields or meta tags. Uh, in, in Alfresco, they call them properties. Um, and so I, I took a step back and said, you know, we need to use the CMS system to do the tagging and identify the three pieces of data, the record category number, the date, the cutoff date, which is the date the document itself or the transaction file or case file was closed, and then whether or not it's an essential document that needs to be kept for longer than for whatever reason, it's it has high value. Um, then we, we basically started that voyage of, of in, uh, interfiling all of the content uh, with those things. And we, we approached it many different ways. One was I would get a list of every document that's in a collection. And I would literally go through that, put it on a spreadsheet, and add the record schedules for every single document. About three million documents into that, I finally decided I was getting tired of that. 
my eyes, I, that was three prescriptions ago. Uh, and, and basically I decided it was, it was time to think of a different way to approach this. And so we started talking about working, and, and there was no support. I would come up with these spreadsheets, detailed spreadsheets, and they would say, that's nice, Dave. I had a lot more hair then. And, and they would, then they would say, uh, we're just going to put this spreadsheet over here and we'll get to that later. Um, and so I was doing what I called records management assessments and handing it to them and they weren't even using them or integrating them. So then I, I took a different tactic with this uh, identifying the content models and then worked, we worked at incorporating and enforcing those fields being populated upon migration. So then it wasn't a matter of going back and doing it, we had to just get it built into the system. Which presented our next roadblock which, uh, which, when we changed from the back burnered RMAs, record management assessments, to, to using a script that would incorporate those things on migration, the script had to be changed. That meant developer dollars, and we got a little bit of resistance from that, a little bit of a roadblock there, or it was inconsistently done, and we had to set up a whole te testing apparatus to make sure it got done effectively and efficiently. That's gone on all the way through to this summer. And, uh, now we're getting to the point where um, we're looking at the post-migration tools of curating the collection and looking at uh, the different kinds of tools we need to go in and globally search for errors or disambiguate collections of, of terms or identify need terms that need updating because these, these things are no longer available. And we're building those markup tools as well as working on the disposal workflows so we can start to put lipstick on our permanent records and a floppy hat and send it to NARA in an acceptable format. That's a whole dance in its own right. But also, more importantly, to start disposing of the temporary records we have in there to protect us from legal risk of having them longer than we should. Because that calls into question our entire uh, program of maintaining documents uh, if there was a, uh, we were able to provide something that's subpoenable. We've, we've gone through a lot of, of, of different kinds of roadblocks, and each time we've had to shift our, our focus a little bit. But I, I, this past year, we were able to, we're just under 30 million documents in this collection. 98% of them are tagged as records. That was a big job. And, and I think that was our success story. But we had to hold to some of our business rules of making sure they're in a finished state, and negotiating with each of these cars that gets on this road to understand its design, how the collections are made, how they tag them, everything, what's important to them, so we can start to build even further kind of like connections. And then the other thing that became a bread and butter thing for this, this program that really made it successful is we became the back-end dock store for other turnkey systems. Um, many turnkey systems, uh, standalone applications that the business lines use uh, would have their own document management system and they were upgrading and it was an opportunity for us to step in and say, hey, on your next upgrade, upgrade your user interface, your workflow, but let us handle the documents and we'll just put a CMIS API connection to the back end doc store and you'll be able to connect. And so the strategy was as soon as they use their comfort zone application to upload those documents, they don't even know that it's in the EDMS. We can set up a search engine within their, their user interface that they can go and search in EDMS, but they don't even know it's there and don't really care. And so that possibility is there, and that's been very successful, and that's where we're leading into our next groups. I think that's it. Well, but I'll take it from here. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Dave, for sharing um, those uh, roadblocks. And he touched on a lot of the roadblocks that we see consistently with other projects. So I thought I'd share a little bit or generalize a little bit about what you might be seeing, too. And maybe you'll have some questions later on. Um, but when we talk about, uh, for instance, barriers to access, right? And these are all, uh, we, when I present these, I want you to realize that all of this happens regardless of whether you wanted to or not, right? You're always going to have roadblocks on the road, on your roadmap. So you, you just prepare yourself for them, right? So you know that there are going to be instances when um, there's going to be content that has uh, security 
or is, you know, um, implications or it's sensitive in ways that may not be um, accounted for in your access control or your roles and how you've structured the, you know, your architecture for your groups. So you should expect that, okay? There's going to be PII. There are going to be legal holds, all right? You're going to have barriers to access. So you have to, you know, present another plan or, or accommodate for that. We always find it's best to be agile and come at, come at it with an agile mindset. Um, also, you know that there's going to be less than favorable conditions. Usually that's how you start out, right? There's not enough money, there are not enough resources. You might find that you have stakeholders who are trying to block your success, you know, so you have to be prepared for that. And one way to prepare for that is to always have the mindset that you're going to have to market this. You know, you're going to have to always understand what the return on investment is and be able to communicate that to your audience. And don't focus so much on compliance because some people may not uh, measure that risk the same way. And they may be willing to take those risks that you think they shouldn't take. But instead, make them understand where the value is. Uh, there's going to be potholes in construction. So anytime you're dealing with systems, and especially records, you know that you're bringing, rec you're bringing systems together. There's going to have to be some uh, synchronization of metadata in order for the information to flow across systems. You know that there's going to have to be integration points, right? And that's always a, a challenge, all right? Not necessarily a stopping point. It's not an obstacle that's going to hinder your success, but it's a challenge that you have to overcome. All right, we also know that the road is not straight. <laughs> you're gonna have detours, right? You're going to look at your backlog and you're going to reassess and change how you prioritize things, right? You're going to have new initiatives come into play and so you have to uh, really account for that. When the project veers into a different direction, you know, be agile and ready for that to occur. Um, so that's, those are some of the potholes and I'd like to uh, bring Dave back because he's going to tell us the lessons learned from this GSA project. Thanks. Thank you. There we go. Um, one of the things we, the way we structured this was to focus on the project itself, but there's a lot of people that have been involved in this. And so those detours and those, those potholes could be people oriented or they could just be budget or prioritization of the or agency itself. But what we were able to do was start to demonstrate with each successful migration. We have 30 different collections, 35 different collections in there uh, now, comprising that nearly 30 million documents. And each one of those is a PMO, a project story of migration, negotiation with people, and actual use of that content after we've uploaded it. Um, we've, we've learned a lot from here and the, the, the back and forth, the three steps forward, two steps back, we call that progress. Um, but uh, we, build record, we build records management on previous accomplishments. So we started from a schedule and then from the schedule we were to build a metadata structure. From a metadata structure we were able to enforce it and start to work on scripts and now we're using that as our format for enhancing our taxonomies and our curatorial tools. Those things all started building from the original schedules that we built. Um, we aim for 100% records management identification on migration. Don't ever think you're gonna get to do it over later, do it, it will never get done. Try to capture it as close to the user as possible um, and, and, and when they create it or when they call it final because that's when it's gonna be the freshest and it's gonna have the best information about that document rather than trying to do it 10 years later or 20 years later. Um, yeah, we got a lot of, we got a lot of old uh, jalopies that came on this road as collections that were, you know, we don't know what this stuff is. We've been, that, that organization's been defunct. We no longer do warehousing in GSA. We haven't done that since 2015, but here's 2.5 million documents. And I have to keep them for six years, which fortunately for me, they can be dumped immediately. Um, but um, it, the whole point is, there's a lot of collections that we, we don't know, but if we can identify them well enough, we can negotiate from a position of strength rather than reaction and not do do-over work later on and throw it in the back, back burner. Find every document's freshness date and use it in bulk whenever possible. 
The idea there is to understand when it was closed. How old is it? Chronology is not as important for people that are in process or, or moving vo large volumes of things, but you've got to advocate for this. And, you know, uh, build systems as though the platform and software will change every three to five years. This is almost hackneyed expression, but you, you know that the system you have now is not going to last that long anymore. We know the churn of software and hardware is pretty regular. And I think a lot of agencies and a lot of companies have bought into the idea that they're going to have to change that out. Understand that records and documents have value that outlast generations of technology. So it's better to focus on your water, the stuff flowing through those pipes, than the pipes themselves. Because it's plumbing, we do. We manage documents. That's, that are useful to the agency. That's where the success comes. Not the IT system itself or the EDMS system, but it's the, abil the ability for people to get access to the findability of the documents. And be an advocate over tech content over technology. You just heard me talk about it. Content's king. Content's going to outlast any technology we have. It, it'll change forms, but it'll still, and your job is to figure out how to keep that content available in people's hands. So those are the lessons we've learned. Do we have anything else? We have a few. We have a few moments for questions, um, burning questions. I think we have a question back there. Oh, yes. <laughs> and what do you do there? <laughs> We'll talk. I've been looking for you. <laughs> Certainly. Certainly. I'm based in Chicago, just so you know. But uh, I'm, I have family here in DC. I grew up here. Um, thank you. Um, this is something, here's a case in point. I was hired in in knowledge management as a knowledge management specialist. I know about your position. Um, and and uh, it came, it went. And then they created it again, not even knowing they had it in the past at a regional <laughs> office. So we'll talk. I saw you on event approval. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been coming for a long time. <laughs> That's how we all come in. How many, how many people started out with an intention of being in knowledge management? How many people here are, are uh, librarians? How many people here are content managers? How many people are in IT that got, got in, in, uh, internalized the need for content <laughs> management? <laughs> OK. That's a lot of you. You understand, it doesn't matter what scenario you're in. It's about the content. Um, and, and that's why I had to redefine records man or knowledge management to records management to suit my own needs. And, and not cry about the fact I, I got pulled out of that KM world. I miss it. But on the other hand, I've managed to make chicken salad out of chicken excrement um, by, by saying, OK, records management is something that can clear a room. And I don't really like it. I'm, I was worried that I was going to fall asleep in my own lecture. Um, but uh, it's, it's something that's important and necessary. And compliance is an issue with the uh, OMB M1921 managing electronic records mandate that we're trying to fulfill. The fact we're no longer using control P to create boxes of paper. We're using control C to make copies of documents. We're, we're no longer, it's no longer about building systems. It's about building flow. And I think those are the big messages I wanted. It's not the, it's not the road, it's the journey, like Dave Snowden said. So we don't want to spend all our time talking about the road construction as much as we want to talk about the user experience of, the, of getting access to those documents. Any other questions? I, I, I can talk forever. Oh, we do? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. oh, we have 10 minutes for questions. Oh. Let me go back then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? I saw him. Yeah, I saw him. Okay.
Well, that's a good question. And in fact, I'm on an ISO committee for sustainable formats. Uh, but uh, in, in that very topic, and identifying uh, way, we, first off, we came up with a list in the early days of ground rules. We came up with a list of what formats we would find acceptable. Uh, no surprises. PDFs, Microsoft Office documents, text files, uh, audio, video, all the standard things. But we weren't going to take a GP4 document or a WP document, which is a WordPress or Word Perfect document. And we can convert them, and we would do conversion services before they came in, but we weren't going to manage that format and guarantee that it was sustainable. The other thing is, whenever we get a new format that becomes a collect part of a collection, we would make sure that it's readable in that format in, in line with our inline reader within Alfresco, or if it wasn't, that we had tools to be able to uh, view it from the client, from the desktop. Good question. Yes, sir. They only need, well, first off, in negotiating with where they're going to put it, we already know what content's coming in for that collection. It's very specialized. And we try to, to catch it in the context that it was created. If it's a contract file, we file it under general records, service, uh, general records uh, schedule number 1.1010. And we know that. And it's a six-year retention period. So it's a contract file, we treat it all as one. We already know the category. What we need to know from the user as the field is when that contract was closed, when the last payment was made, so we knew how, when to start counting that sixth fiscal year uh, clock. Often, we, um, in, in many cases, we don't need to have the users do this. We, can, we have enough of a data, uh, data mart that we can draw on an API connection to our bu business intelligence to pull that date of closure out of that, that field to identify closed contracts and automatically set the ticker without any user interface. And so we, that was part of the, the, the attraction is people just upload the documents in the document management system. It populates on migration or on upload the content uh, fields we need for records management work, and then it goes into the system and it picks up based on the business rules of those fields uh, the, the knows what to do with it. Yeah, and I can add to that, actually. Um, so oftentimes, the, the, a user will upload the same type of documents, right? So that user themselves might have a profile or had a profile with metadata attached so that the, when the user uploads the document that they always do because they're a contractor <laughs> or a core, right, um, then then it automatically populates based on the user. So there's many different methods. You know, you have to be really uh, discerning in um, how you can capture metadata without having to rely on the user. Good question. Because it's hard to drive, drive horses to drink, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It's it's a draft right now. It's a criteria for sustainable format that we're working on as a part of a working group. It's an international group. Um, I'm on the ANSI committee representing the U.S., one of many. Uh, but basically the idea is to identify those formats that can be um, acceptable and sustained. And part of this is NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration has a list of sustainable formats that we use as our guide for the most part. And as a policy uh, for GSA in general, if you go to sustainable formats under, under archives.gov, reading out websites, I told myself I wouldn't <laughs> do that. But if, if, you, uh, if, you go to, if you go to the NARA website, they have a list of sustainable formats for every different kind of document or every kind of format, uh, uh, electronic format. And I don't have a number yet, the ISO. Uh, the ISO number is actually cited in there. Oh. And it, there's different standards for each one of those. But, but the, the criteria document we've been working on, in fact, they're working on it this week, and I can't be at that meeting. So <laughs> but it, we're, we're looking to get the draft out in the next year or two, uh, actually the final copy out. It's a, new, it's a new technical standard. 
Yes. Crystal ball. <sighs> I could tackle them, but I, I don't want to tackle an agency. NARA used to be part of GSA until 1985. And we were their test dummy on record scheduling uh, for 40 years. And so we ended up with quite a mess. Um, but um, I think that if I were to look at a crystal ball, I would, since everything is electronic, I would like to see NARA um, take on the role of being that place to keeping both temporary and permanent documents. Their Federal Record Center program is, is focused mainly on, was focused on temporary storage of, of federal agency documents for a period of time, and then they were either transferred to, to the archive side for public document access, or they were destroyed on schedule. Well, they're getting out of the storage business. They only want the documents that are going to be made eventually public documents from now on. And uh, after next month, the end of next month in December, uh, they're going to only accept them in an electronic form. But they also have, uh, they don't have much of an infrastructure electronically. And so I think if I had a crystal ball, I think I would love to see Congress fund a national federal record center for all agencies. So we don't have to keep rebuilding this in our 400 odd agencies that we have out there. <laughs> and then they can manage the stuff after we give it to them. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it.